the climax of the Iranian embassy siege in 1980, the SAS burst onto the world's television screens and became an instant legend. The regiment had been training for this day for 10 years, and it would define them in the popular imagination. Dark and brutal, but undeniably glamorous. At the time, the heroics of the embassy siege and the killing of the terrorists there were seen as morally uncomplicated. But using special forces to sort out civil problems in the UK was to become far more controversial when they were sent in to counter homegrown terrorism in Northern Ireland. When you're actually involved in the operation itself, you don't think of the danger, you just think that um, this is our job, we're unstoppable, let's do it. And if you have to kill somebody who is armed, you've got to pull the trigger, because, you know, these guys don't mess around. You know, it's kill or be killed, I'm afraid. The letters SAS are most likely to conjure an image of black-clad supermen. Invincible, ruthless killers. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. In fact, the role of counter-terrorist urban warrior was a new and hastily acquired one for a regiment more used to fighting secret but orthodox wars in the far-flung deserts and jungles of the world. But in the 1960s, a new threat faced the world, international terrorism. Extremists learned that they could blackmail governments and win publicity by hijacking aircraft or taking hostages. When terrorists kidnapped Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics in 1972, German police made a disastrous rescue attempt which ended in a bloodbath. This prompted the British government to instruct the SAS to set up a counter-revolutionary warfare wing. By the time of the Iranian embassy siege, years of training had prepared the SAS for exactly such a crisis. What the TV cameras didn't see followed a well-rehearsed but hitherto untested set of moves here recreated. How to storm a room, kill the gunman, but leave the hostages unscathed. The tactics had been perfected in a special area at their headquarters, known as the Killing House. The Killing House is a multi-purpose range, um, consisting of several rooms, um, a large combat room, smaller combat rooms and individual combat rooms. They're all fully kitted out for um, 360 degree arcs of fire, so you can literally open fire anywhere in the room apart from through the door which you just entered the range by. Sometimes you may rush in, so you're making noise. Other times you go sneaky beaky, you know. It could be daytime, it could be nighttime. The SAS developed techniques which would one day be copied around the world. We had to train to go onto aircraft, we had to train to go on trains, we had to train to go on ships. Anything that uh, where there were crowds of people, where people are likely to become hostages. You know, we had to train to, um, you know, to be, to be able to get them out. The basic room combat was all learnt inside the killing house. And these skills were honed and improved literally on a daily basis. Uh, because the SES anti-terrorist team does train on a daily basis. Only live ammunition is used in the killing house. Many thousands of rounds of it every year, compared to the handful allowed the regular one. SAS soldiers themselves often play the role of hostage, surrounded by targets representing the terrorists and trusting their lives to the skill of their colleagues. I used to stand there against the wall. Either I'd do it or my mate would do it, we'd swap about. And I'd stand against the wall and we used to have these uh, targets. They used to call them Hans Head, basically plywood head. And there'd be one there and one there. Right? And I'd stand against the wall and the other had done was a pair of goggles because you get the old crap coming at the end of the gun. And my mate would come in, blah, 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 bang, 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 
you know. And he put two rounds in his head and two rounds in the other. I just stood there, you know. But he didn't bat an eyelid, you know, because I trust him. And he's trusted me when it was my turn to do it, you know. On the 30th of April 1980, Snapper, Mac and their fellow team members were actually in the killing house when they heard that the Iranian embassy in London had been taken over by a gang of armed gunmen. For the first time they would face not dummies or their mates, but real terrorists. Inside the embassy, 26 hostages were being held captive by six Arab terrorists protesting against Ayatollah Khomeini's persecution of their people in South Iran. Within 24 hours, the SAS team had traveled to London and begun to plan a meticulous, coordinated assault using intelligence gathered from secret cameras and listening devices. They even built a model of the building. Gradually, we just built up a good picture of what the building was like. Um, we'd actually had ground floors drawn out in the gym, the place we were staying, so we could sort of walk through it without the walls try and get it in your mind's eye. I mean, the idea was, so we could, if we did go in there, we could actually go in there without thinking. You know, do we turn left, do we turn right? We'd actually know it, you know, without thinking. On day six of the siege, after countless deadlines had passed with no concessions granted, the terrorist leader finally snapped and murdered a hostage. His body was pushed out of the front door at 6.20 p.m. At 7.07 p.m., Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher gave permission for the SAS to take control of the crisis. Nineteen minutes later, this is what the world saw. The man holding the wooden frame is Mac, who's an explosives expert. He's about to blast through the embassy's armoured glass windows. My job was put the explosive charge on the window. Place the frame charge, moved back to the safety of the balcony, blew the window and then made their way through that window into the embassy. The name of the game is uh, maximum entry points. You've got to try and get people in on every floor. I mean, there's like blocks on the back. Had people have sailing down. Guys going on the roof. People going in through the skylight. All in all, possibly around 50 assaulters. As Lord Nelson said, it takes numbers to annihilate. It was a baptism of fire, but so far it was working. In two and four man teams moving fast, the SAS began hunting through the building using CS gas and disorienting explosive devices they developed in the killing house. It's multi-room combat basically, rolling down the corridor, clearing each room systematically. You've got to get in there fast, you've got to be aggressive, and you've got to surprise them. Luckily we've got the stun grenades, which they do create a big surprise. The idea is to disorientate them with the flashes and the bangs and the smoke, etc., enabling you to get in there very quickly and swiftly clear in the room. Then that goes in and you're right behind it. If it gives you that couple of seconds distraction, you have got the upper hand. Because we've done it so often, uh, you don't really notice it. You just carry on charging in and doing your job and the things are flashing around, you know, banging and flashing around, around you and uh, you don't notice it. Once inside, Max Group came across one of the hostages, Police Constable Locke, who was struggling with the terrorist leader known as Salim. Locke had managed to conceal a pistol throughout the siege, but all his training as a policeman made him reluctant to use it. The SAS had no such compunction. We dominated the room, then our other two members of the team, they came in, they moved through us, and then they moved on to the next room. This is where Salim and PC Locke were sort of scrabbling about, and they went in and dealt with Salim. When you get in a building like that, there's gas swirling around, there's smoke, there's confusion, there's panicking people, and you have got to be sufficiently trained to be able to sort out who is the terrorist and who is the hostage. With the terrorist leader dead and PC Locke safely 